Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sixth episode of the School of Resistance, a live stream format that invites experts on change around the world to discuss valuable alternatives for the future and to create a blueprint for, polit for politics of resistance. Today's episode is supported by the initiatives Watch the Met Alarm Phone and Seebrücke and is entitled Our Human Rights Are on Fire towards a humane migration policy. And we're very honored to discuss this today with human rights activist Effie Latsudi, and normally also human rights activist Mohamed al Kashef and Musi Sarai that unfortunately are not there yet to join us, probably because of urgent reasons and we'll stay in touch about if they can join maybe later. When on March 26, reports uncovered the first COVID-19 cases along the Greek-Turkish border, several NGOs and human rights activists demanded the immediate evacuation of the refugee camps. Yet, Europe remained silent. When a fire broke out during the night of September the 8th and destroyed the overcrowded refugee camp Moria on the Greek island Lesbos, Lesbos the same NGOs and human rights activists demanded the immediate accommodation of refugees by the European member states. But once more, Europe remained silent. While the pandemic forces people around the world to stay at home, another large group of people is looking for one. In this episode, we will, together with hopefully Musi Sarai, Mohamed al Kashef, and luckily Effie Latsudi, discuss Europe's inadequacy and unwillingness in addressing the migration crisis. Before we start this conversation, I quickly want to remind the people listening at this moment of the possibility to engage in the conversation. For everyone who is watching live, you're welcome to send us your questions by emailing to schoolofresistance at antigent.be or by commenting on the live stream on the Facebook pages of Antigent or IIPM or on Twitter via the hashtag School of Resistance. Effie Latsudi, it's a great honor. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you're in a very urgent situation, so even more, I'm very honored that you made some time free for this important conversation. Um, just to introduce you further, you are a psychologist, human rights activist, and the driving force behind PICPA Camp, an independent open refugee camp aiming to be a community-based space drawing on the principles of solidarity, empowerment, and active participation. In 2016, you received the UNHCR Nansen Refugee Award for your long-standing commitment to helping refugees on the Aegean Sea. Maybe as a first broad introduction question, could you tell a bit more about how PICPA Camp came into being and how it operates? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and I feel honored to share um, about Pick by Now work uh, with the School of Resistance because actually all what we do is about resistance and hope and our future. So it's, it's really important. How we started Pick uh, Look, uh, we I, I live in Lesbos since 2001 and actually I didn't know much about what is happening with refugees. Uh, Till uh, some friends of mine uh, talked to me about the deaths and the people that are all, that were already buried in the cemetery of Lesbos, and that's how I started to to understand that there was already a camp, there was detention, violation of the rights of the people, and silence in the European level, in the Greek level, and of course in the local society, and and that people detained, they were not even people for us. They were something like some illegal alien, uh, whatever. It's sad for, uh, for our society to live like this, to, to accept that people are suffering ne next to us and we don't react, we don't want to know. And this is something that mobilized me to understand more, to participate in local groups, to, to to become an activist in the in this field um, and an active citizen actually so in 2012 uh, we had already 
a huge financial crisis in Greece. We have a very uh, tragic moment because the Golden Dawn, uh, the fascist party was uh, first time in the, in the parliament and that shocked us. And uh, most of the rhetoric of this uh, party was based on refugees, criminality, danger, and all this, and on the fact that refugees were excluded uh, by the society, were living in a, in a very um, in bad conditions, and they were also living, uh, you know, behind. I mean, they were hiding somehow. They they were they were not criminals, but somehow they were excluded and criminalized, and that also fed uh, all this rhetoric and all this fear in the society. The, and um, we faced this uh, tragic moment where this party became, became powerful in the Greek parliament. It was like, so we started a network of solidarity. You know, it's very important to talk about this now and on your uh, context because it, we were desperate. <laughs> I mean, desperate. And, um, at this point, and, and, and um, attacked by different sides, you know, financially, politically. Um, and at this point, we decided to create an, a network of solidarity to unite our power in the local level, different people, very different politically, and to, to support the Greek people and the refugees. And that's how we ask for this uh, abandoned uh, summer camp for children to use it as an open uh, solidarity place hospi for hospitality that the local people will support uh, the refugees. At the beginning, it was impossible because the authorities, it was out of the question. And they told us, no, this cannot happen. There is no police, there is no authority. You are, what are you? Refugees need to be arrested and detained. At the end, uh, because we were insisting and because there were many people sleeping in the streets and the, the locals started to, to mobilize, uh, it became also visible. They gave us the keys and we started operating in November 2012. And that's how PICPA started. And so you got a place. Uh, could you say a little bit more? Because it's it's a place on the island that you uh, appointed, that you wished for, or this was uh, given by the authorities and decided like this is the place you get. It it was in a summer camp for children uh, that was abandoned. Uh, a nice uh, uh, location with small wooden houses that was abandoned because of the of the financial crisis and mm. was falling apart. We knew the place and we appointed the place because uh, uh, in the emergency, in the no border camp of 2009, where many, many people were uh, reacting in the um, inside and outside the detention place of uh, Pagani back then, uh, we put pressure and uh, 400 minors were uh, hosted there. So we knew the place. We also had uh, um, the first families uh, that they were in the streets, not arrested by the police. We, we took them to PICPA. That was like a criminal action back then for the authorities. But we took them to PICPA and we negotiated with the authorities that these people should not be arrested. The situation is bad on the island. And uh, you, you, can, uh, you can register them and let them go. So it was the first time that we managed to negotiate with the authorities under the pressure of a movement, no border camp, no border camp, no 2009. So they, they accepted that vulnerable, that families should not be separated and they should not be detained. For, for the first time, it was a step. And we, we asked for this place and we didn't, we didn't believe actually, it was like an utopia. Um, when we were talking about this with our friends, they told us it's impossible. In the Greek context, it's impossible to allow an open, self-organized place without the presence of the police. It's impossible. It, is the, it was the impossible. And uh, for me, that's, that's the hope that when we come together, we can do it. 
How many people were involved and, and how was this, um, what do you think made it possible? Was it because so many people from the island yes. were involved and put, yes. put pressure? There were may, many people uh, from different parts of the society. They were also desperate because of the financial crisis that brought uh, and because of the Golden Dome threat. And uh, it was also the, the church uh, involved, uh, which is not uh, very usual in the Greek context. And it, we, politically, we, it was very wide. Mm. And uh, the, the fact that local people were participating made it possible, I believe. And the mm. fact that we knew and we used our knowledge of uh, what could happen because Our idea was like, okay, detention is not working, is not for refugees. You make people suffering and suffering brings more violence. And it's, it, it's just a punishment. It doesn't make sense. People need to be treated by people, need to be supported by people. And also isolating refugees make, make, makes us, make, creates a distance between us. And we feel, we feel that they are something different, which is not the case. It was more effective and it was no cost because mm -hmm. we were bringing the food, the clothes, and it was just a dignified place with nothing, no money involved. So how did it operate? Uh, I mean, the context seems extremely precarious. Everyone uh, was suffering under financial crisis, but you, I guess you, you did need some resources, water, showers, I don't know, food. No, there was uh, water, there was, uh, the premises were there. There was water, electricity, uh, we have been offered uh, blankets, uh, pillows, all these things from different sources, organization, local people, uh, churches all over the Greece. And also we were cooking there uh, uh, from uh, ourselves. Uh, the people were cooking in their houses. I was, it was a very, we were calling this as a, the miracle of Pikva because when the food was uh, finishing, you know, you could have a group of people who arrived um, in the middle of the night and they were bringing them to Pikva. And we didn't have food. And someone was arriving with a kettle or a cooking. It was really amazing. <laughs> it was really heartwarming. Yeah. And to see all this, and at this point, 2012, even my friends, they were telling me, why are they coming? We are in a crisis. Because it was also Syrians who started to arrive and the numbers were big. And I was thinking, okay, they don't choose to come, but many people were afraid of these um, people arriving. But when they saw them in the streets, when they were able to support them with food, the minimum, or some clothes, they started to change the mentality and they started to feel proud for what they are doing. And I remember pictures of people, full of people coming with their food and uh, with the clothes, with their kids. It changed a lot this, um, at this moment the, um, the, the, the mentality of the local people. This was eight years ago in 2012. Uh, mm -hmm. It still exists. Um, how, how did it uh, grow, develop, change over the course of years? And what did it meant for you also as a coordinator, initiator? Um, how has your role been defined throughout um, Big Bang? I, I, I'm, I was feeling from the beginning uh, as a part of a group of people. And I'm always highlighting that this is not possible by one or two people. This is possible by many people. And maybe you cannot have the names, but there are so many people that they give their energy, their work, their uh, imagination, even their dreaming. Uh, that make this kind of work possible and effective. So I feel part of this, and that is the strongest part of this work. And um, I, I, I felt also that we were part of the of something that is that is important to happen as an exam example, and that uh, gave us the power to believe that uh, the. When you believe in something, you can do it, and you come together with other people, you can do it, and you are in the in the in the right track. You are you are doing 
the right thing for us. That was the thing. Um, people developed throughout the years. We, we, we changed many times the way we were operating, like uh, we had the uh, asylum seekers that they were staying in uh, PICPA waiting for their asylum to be processed when there was no uh, shelter for the asylum, uh, um, the people who applied for asylum. Uh, we had the homeless refugees that when Moria was created in 2013, that they, they, they didn't fit in Moria or they were, uh, they were taking a paper to go out of Moria, but then there was no boat and they were staying in the streets. So we were supporting them. It was quite flexible. And that's also a very dynamic part of this because it was not a project. It was not an EU project. It was a, a social place, flexible, open. Um, in 2000, uh, and we had many eviction also uh, threats. Every year, uh, the municipality, the authorities were taking a decision, let's close PICPA, uh, we give this place back to the locals, which is great when we don't face this level of crisis in Lesbos. Yeah? Um, so, for example, in 2015, before the big crisis, the mayor had again decided to close the PICPA. We told to, to, the numbers were increasing. You remember it started from 500 in May and then we went to 8,000 per day in uh, August, uh, September. So we, we talked to him and we said, okay, great. You can use the place for the summer, but not now. I mean, it's not the moment. <laughs> Um, later, he, he also acknowledged that uh, we did the right thing because in PICPA in 2015, we hosted uh, almost 26,000 people and there were people like 20, 200 every day coming and going. It was a, it, a huge operation because we were feeding people in, the, in Moria, outside in the port, distributing, connecting with other groups. A lot of volunteers arrived a lot of people that they wanted to support. Uh, we had, um, we were feeling very proud for being there and uh, hosting all these people that they had no place to go. I mean, pregnant women, uh, sick children, uh, uh, handicapped, a lot of handicapped people or uh, with uh, severe mental health issues. And I must tell you that the, uh, from one hand, it was a network of solidarity that made us proud at this point, everywhere in the, in the beaches, welcoming people, an international movement of solidarity that gave also, it was chaotic many times, but it, that gave a lot of solutions in a completely chaotic situation from the authorities, first of all, no coordination at all. <laughs> They, we, all these people, they made it possible to support other people and to feel proud about the positive move, movement and the positive uh, position of solidarity. That was the, the very positive uh, thing at this moment. The other thing was that the borders were open and people were arriving. They had a very difficult time. Moria was a mess, people and garbage everywhere, a mess with the authorities. But at the same time, they were going in one, two days, and you could see the hope in the face and the smile coming back because they were moving to, to their dream. I mean, to the thing that, to Europe that they believe that, uh, okay, they, they will solve all the problems anyway. But this, this uh, possibility to move out was very important. Yes, yes. At the same time, I must say also the very tragic part of this 2015 uh, moment for us. We were hosting also the, the victims that we did it since 2013, the victims of tragedies, the people who survived shipwrecks, uh, the relatives. We had been participating for, for months in uh, funerals every day. That was the tragic part and the very hard part that traumatized us, uh, but also made us feel very proud that we managed to, to be there for these people and to share with them and not to ignore them or to, to leave them alone. 
Thank you. Thank you, Effie. That's um, quite a, an amazing uh, story that I have many more questions about. But in the meantime, um, I'm very happy to uh, announce and see that Mohamed Alkashev has been able to join us. Very warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, so um, we already started the conversation, um, uh, Mohamed Alkashev and Effie Latsudi uh, just explained about um, Peak Back Camp, a camp that she uh, created with many others um, at uh, Lesbos um, in 2012, uh, so eight years ago, and uh, the many aspects uh, involved in that. Uh, but let me first uh, proper introduce you further, uh, Mohamed Alkashev. Uh, you are a human rights lawyer and a researcher on refugee rights and migrant movements. You work as a consultant and advocate, and you're also a member with uh, Watch the Med Alarm Phone, a network supporting refugees and migrants crossing the Mediterranean Sea and the right of freedom of movement. Um, so maybe before uh, we um, start talking more with uh, Effie about PICPA and also many questions I have for both of you, um, could you maybe first tell a bit more about uh, Watch the Med Alarm Phone, this organization that you have been uh, working with for quite some time and how it functions? Um, hello all, hello Lara, thanks for introducing me. Um, I would say Alarm Phone uh, started as the main project of uh, Watch the Med, uh, which is an NGO uh, working in documentation, human rights violation, uh, specifically at sea. Um, the need of uh, having Alarm Phone actually uh, was obvious in 2015, uh, when there was a big shipwreck happened uh, full of Eritreans and Somalians, people and Ethiopians from uh, East African countries. <clears throat> and it was scandal because uh, they tried many times before drowning uh, to contact the concerned authority uh, called MRCC Rome. Uh, the Italian Coast Guard was aware and informed about the situation, but people uh, left there to die. So the idea came that if there was a, a kind of mediator or a hotline uh, from the civil society that they can reach, uh, so it would be easily uh, to uh, communicate with the concerned authorities, to communicate with the MRCCs. MRCC, for the people who doesn't know it, it's a Maritime Rescue Coordination Center. Uh, which meant to be uh, the center that coordinate the rescue missions in the time of distress. And actually, Alarm Phone now uh, considered as uh, an important uh, hotline for the people crossing the sea, uh, for the people who uh, do and uh, migrate, let's say, or uh, travel uh, and officially. Uh, from North Africa uh, or from Africa, crossing the Mediterranean to Europe. And how it's functioning, they contact when the people are in distress at the sea, they contact Alarm Phone and give them a clear uh, information about uh, their location, about uh, how many are them, uh, about the condition on the boat, what the type of the boat they use, if it's a rubber boat, wooden boat, uh, boat, whatever. And then Alarm Phone take all this information and start to communicate with the concerned authority and start to write about the cases on different social media channels to make a public awareness about the situation. And, and so actually this kind of um, civil tool instrument um, could, was able to put pressure and to make sure that people would really uh, get out and rescue. Yeah, that they could put the pressure that people on the boat couldn't put themselves. Yeah, actually most of the cases that Alarm Phone would succeed somehow to, uh, to, to put the pressure and the political pressure, the public pressure, on the states, on the different uh, uh, state uh, institutions uh, to rescue people and to save their lives. And also, as we see, also there is the civil fleet, like the different uh, 
civil rescue NGOs in the Mediterranean, like Sea Watch, Mediterranea, um, and, and different actors at the sea. Uh, and also we communicate with them after the case become public and become official uh, to the states. And can I ask what your uh, specific position is within the organization? Like what is your role or would you really receive also these kind of calls or what is your position? Uh, so uh, in this network, we have no certain positions, but we have kind of uh, experienced people somehow. So I'm as a lawyer and advocacy officer, I uh, represent, sometimes I represent uh, the network in uh, public events. I do advocacy work uh, concerning the migration uh, issue in the Mediterranean. Uh, but also alarm phone works as uh, shift teams. So we have teams that operate in shift works for 24 hours, seven days. And every single member has the rule uh, to take shifts and uh, to be available for uh, holding the shift phone uh, and to be working with the hotline to receive calls and to receive uh, distress calls from people while they are crossing. Thank you, very clear. Um, maybe a follow-up question uh, to you both. Um, Effie and I were already speaking a bit about it uh, on forehand when we were preparing this, uh, this conversation. So of course, since the fires in at Moria camp, uh, there's a huge attention in the press again, if it comes to Europe's uh, migration policies. And the question that rises is, is this something positive? Is this a momentum that we're uh, living at the moment uh, that we could maybe push for certain things? Uh, or are you actually both very concerned about certain things that are not mentioned or not getting enough attention? Um, if, if you both would like to respond. Um, so, if you want me to start, yes, yes, okay, we must say and we must uh, make the point um, that uh, in all this tragedy throughout the years and because I'm involved since 2005 and I can see the difference and because we've been talking about a large phone in Lesbos at this time uh, when it was starting and it's very important that this happened. Um, it's very important that um, we have this, somehow this tragedy of Lesbos became uh, a focus and uh, it's not invisible anymore. Uh, so yes, we have, uh, and I, I find it positive that we have media attention. It could be a worst, it's a disaster still, but it could be a worst disaster <laughs> without the press mm. attention. Uh, but it's very frustrating that uh, there is so much coverage of the media coverage and still we have these conditions. We had Moria for years. People were literally tortured in Moria. They were suffering. Human rights were violating. Lots of corruption, lots of money going around in this sit, sit, city place and uh, lots of deaths. And uh, the media attention was, okay, sometimes more, sometimes less, but it, it was not invisible like before. Um, so, yes, I believe that this positive, positive, but still we, we have a disaster which is documented somehow. I don't know what else needs to be said or shared and what can make the change. Because still uh, a new camp is built, uh, which is completely inhuman. Uh, I mean, uh, pushback are happening, uh, groups are uh, criminalized, uh, NGOs are attacked, fascists yeah. are uh, very active. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> the full tragedy what? is there, but we're talking yeah. about it. Yeah, but yeah. then the question is, what does it, what does it move? Um, exactly. Um, Mohamed Akashev, when I would like to mention you shorter, should I say Mohamed or Kashev? How do we call you? Or shall I stay with Mohamed Akashev? Uh, Kashev. Kashev is okay. Kashef? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Kashef. Um, what about your perspective on the current media coverage? Is it helpful? 
uh, what should it focus on more? What is it forgetting or what should it mobilize? Okay, actually, uh, when it comes to Moria, I was there uh, last year. Uh, I'm, I'm working on the field since 2012 uh, from the other side of the Mediterranean, from Egypt. And uh, I was in uh, contact and in touch with many Syrian uh, refugees who uh, just fleed from Egypt to Turkey uh, during uh, what was called the summer of migration to cross the Aegean. Uh, to Greece, to Europe, and they stuck in Lesbos. And at that time, uh, 2014, 2015, I started to hear and to be in, in, in a kind of contact uh, on Moria. And uh, last year, I was there for the first time uh, in my life, and I have seen it. In reality, I have seen how people are living in tents, how people are living in this uh, olive uh, hill, and they call it the jungle. And it's really uh, describing the situations there. Uh, lack of water, lack of infrastructure, uh, and it's crazy. It's really crazy. Like uh, the, the camp itself is overloaded which make people to, or UNHCR and other organizations to build tents outside. Uh, and it's not the first time uh, in, in Moria to have uh, a fire or a, a burning uh, incident. Last year, uh, the same date, approximately in September 2019, there was also a fire, a big fire, and people flee from the, the camp and they go down to the, to the city and they uh, sit for hours next, uh, next to the sea uh, until everything came calm again and they went back to the camp. There wasn't poor media coverage and uh, no one covered what happened last year. This year, actually, because it's kind of bigger and uh, the camp burned it down uh, and there was a lot of noise on the media, there was different uh, reactions. And uh, But still, what we are missing in the media is the voice of the people themselves, the voices of migrants and refugees uh, in Moria. Uh, we, we all experienced the uncertainty during uh, and, and until this moment during this COVID uh, crisis internationally, but we still don't feel this is the daily struggle of the migrants and refugees, not just in Lesbos, not just in Moria, but all over the Mediterranean. Even in the camps and in, in, in the European countries, the uncertainty, you don't know about tomorrow. You don't know what, how it will be and what you can do. And that's all actually uh, something missing to be announced and mentioned in media coverage. Yeah, I think that's a very um, strong point you're making because it's somehow also reproducing this idea of we talk about them, the others, the refugees, and it stays this kind of huge group of faceless people that are suffering, kind of uh, falling together with the idea of the victim, but it stays very abstract. Uh, and what uh, Effie was saying before also, like the whole idea is that they are people like you and me with similar stories, backgrounds, wishes, desires. Um, so the question is maybe also like, what kind of strategies do we need in order for them, um, for, for us to be able to identify uh, and see us as one common uh, people. Effie, um, maybe two-fold um, question. Um, Kashev was describing uh, this uh, hell on earth uh, called the jungle, Moria. Um, so it raises questions about how Pikpa and Moria were somehow related to each other. Like, was there any communication? Who, who could decide if someone stayed in Moria or came to Pikpa or... Uh, so um, I think this dynamic uh, would be interesting to understand better. And then maybe the second question of Kashev, how can we give voice to the people themselves? Maybe you have also some thoughts about that. Okay. 
First of all, I must tell you that he didn't describe Moria because Moria, you cannot describe it. <laughs> and I cannot describe it. You cannot imagine how people were living there. And he knows that as long as we try, it's difficult to, to, to communicate the, the, the level of humiliation and the level of uncertainty, the le level of violation of rights in Moria. <laughs> Second, I believe that we don't miss the, the stories of the refugees. We miss uh, the, the bridges as you are talking about, because there are, from my experience here, there are stories of refugees out. There are. If we don't listen to this, if we don't understand that these are people and we don't give them the right um, channels is another thing, but stories of refugees are out now. And this, uh, we, we, I mean, it has been so much exposed in different media, alternative media, mainstream media, whatever, it's not about information. It's something else that is missing, for sure. Pigpa was referring people uh, from, uh, from uh, Moria by uh, the, 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 the main uh, referral pathways uh, because we wanted the people to be also in a, uh, to have access to CAS program to all the rights and also to tra transfers to mainland. But also we had other organizations supporting, uh, referring people. And we had also, we were identifying cases and we were bringing them to PICPA. So it's, it is uh, the difference uh, between PICPA and uh, Moria is not only the conditions, it's the fact that people were dignified, they had some kind of control of their life. And of course they, they did, that we couldn't avoid. They, they also wanted to go. They wanted to move on. They wanted to know what is their future. And they were also under this uncertainty, uncertainty that was mentioned very well, that they don't know what will happen to them. This is a political thing. This was a, a, a policy implemented against them. Of course, they had the freedom and they had the space to, 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 to deal with it. Bet better than in Moria, and they didn't have the everyday fights. Also, it, the fires in Moria, it was every year. In 2016, we had deaths in fires. Last year, we had deaths in fires. People were burned. You cannot imagine this hell. Fires were there, fights were there, deaths were there. Everything was there, no reaction, not real reaction. And most of it, we have to differentiate. There was a, there is a policy there. There is information, press, alternative uh, media, whatever. But there is a policy implemented that it's in in Greek level, govern the government and in uh, European level. And there is uh, there are money spent for these conditions. It's not you know ah a humanitarian crisis. So many people arrived. What can we do? No, everything was happening under the European funding and the monitoring and under all this pre, pre, um, press and whatever. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that what we are missing is the, of course, the refugees need to go out and need to speak, but are they speaking as victims? Are they the victims and they are, they, we give them also some space to our uh, media? And we are repeating the same and the same. What are we? What are we missing in this mess here? In this tragedy of the people? What information are missing? Um, Kashef, you were saying uh, um, we do need more stories of of, of refugees themselves. Um, Effie, Effie is doubting, but I think uh, she very clearly um, um, describes this this. Uh, the situation that actually everything is there in order to change it. So it almost gives you the feeling like it's actually policy. This whole camp and and the hell on earth is in a way a terrible, uh, very uh, uh, clear outcome of of of, uh, of of policy that is implemented. And uh, so so what can we do? I mean, what is missing to paraphrase uh, Effie? Yeah, just to, I, to clarify my point, I'm not saying that there is a missing stories. There is missing voices. The people don't speak for themselves, even if they are able and willing and have the capability and the skills to speak out. We, as we, 
experts, Europeans, people concerned about situation, don't give them a proper space to express themselves and express their struggles because no one will speak about their struggles better than them. So this is the thing. And I totally agree with Evie. There, there is a lot of information out there. Like the information nowadays is too much for anyone want to educate themselves to know about the situation. It's out there. It's not the lack of information, not lack of the stories. But the thing, as you mentioned also, about the political intentions. There is no political intention to change the situation. Even if there is a lot of initiatives around Europe, for example, if we take Germany as an example, there is this big initiative called We Have in Platz. We have a place. And there is a work uh, coordinating with the municipalities, with the cities themselves, with the official bodies of the state. But until this moment, there is no political intention. No politician wanted to take a decision and to decide to relocate people. And instead of that, they are building a new Moria. So this is the problem. And if you are asking me what the solution or how we uh, help in, the, in this situation and try to give the people a space to speak for themselves, actually we have enough resources to do so. It's all about planning. It's all about uh, missing a strategy for all of us to come together and then to go to Moria to let people speak for themselves, not a, a, a foreigner correspondent going there and visit to do uh, media coverage, to do a couple of interviews with people. There is a really touching story there. There is a people with a great experience, with outstanding skills and, and life experience, and we have to listen to them. We have to make, not to just to, to talk about them to the public and to make the, uh, the, the awareness, but also to put the pressure on the politicians to move forward, to do something instead of just discussing and negotiating and meeting from time to time in process or in uh, any other European uh, headquarters to uh, discuss the crisis of refugees. It's not a refugees crisis. This is a political crisis, I would say. Excellent. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. I can totally relate. And I think, um, uh, I don't only speak for myself if I talk about the um, huge uh, powerlessness that we also, and maybe also passiveness that we kind of um, enter into because we are just um, so horrified by the cruelty that we show every day. I mean, the Netherlands, I'm in the Netherlands, just decided that we will take a hundred refugees, a hundred. It's, it's, I'm so ashamed to even pronounce this. It's, it's uh, beyond imagination. And to make it worse, it's not 100 extra. It's actually instead of 100 that we would anyway take next year from um, UN HCR. So it's, it's, it's really a level of politics that you cannot imagine. Uh, and I know you can, so I should not explain this to you. But it's, it's, um, it's devastating and it's very, I'm amazed by both of your courage and strength to just continue the struggle, even though we hear this kind of information that just leaves us um, fully speechless. Before we, we go back to this huge qu uh, question, what to do, let's maybe first uh, get back a bit to uh, entangle uh, a little bit more of this uh, uh, super complex situation. Um, so one of the things is, um, that what we hear often European, European countries saying is that the reason they don't want to welcome more refugees is because they are afraid it will uh, fuel right-wing parties. It will uh, create more racism. It will create more uh, xenophobia. Um, and uh, we also know, uh, and Effie has been talking about uh, Golden Dawn in, uh, in Greece and also in, in Italy, we, we see it happening, or at least maybe we should um, ask Effie actually um, how you are experiencing this, because I 
uh, read a couple of articles about um, locals pushing people on boats back to their country and and it's difficult as an outsider to understand like is this massive are these individuals um so uh and we can also imagine that uh before we easily judge and say these are fascists uh i can also imagine that the life on the island has just changed drastically and um, also people in greece feel abandoned um, so could you maybe uh, say a bit more about um, the level of, of... First of all, I must tell you about this uh, rhetoric that uh, refugees are creating the fascist and all this. In my experience, is the, the policies that we implement, uh, the criminalization, the, the exclusion of refugees, the lack of... Uh, um, policies to, to support these people, to empower these people, to and the lack of, uh, of our participation in this system, because actually this is not something, I mean, I believe that migration and refugee uh, issues are very complex, very, very complex, like any human story. And uh, we need uh, for sure include all the powers of the society to deal with this and not the authorities, not the European project and whatever. We need to be involved in this and we need to find solutions that are also personal, personalized because every person has a story. It's not refugees, they are people and people are different and they, they, they have different and complex stories. And instead of supporting them and protecting them, we re-traumatizing them in the camps, on the way, in Greece, in another camp, on the way to Europe. So these people are for years powerless, traumatized, re-traumatized, humiliated. And then we are talking about what? About integration. This is a very complex story. When I was talking about the, the Golden Dawn in Greece, we were talking about refugees that they were arriving, they were detained, criminalized, threatened by the police, beaten, 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 no access to any right, no access to asylum. They were hiding in uh, basements in Athens. And then, of course, there were ghettos, there were uh, small gags. Of course, if you're staying three and four and five years in the streets and you are beaten whenever you are out, of course, there would be some kind of... Um, <laughs> it's normal, but we created this. And I'm telling you, when we had PICPA open and people were coming and going, we didn't have the same reaction. Of course, we didn't have the same numbers, I know. But in 2015, it was not the same. We had almost a million people passed by, 800,000. We didn't have this level of violence that we have now with less people, with inhuman conditions in Moria when, when people were trapped, with all this violence inside and outside in Moria, and with the rhetoric of the local authorities and the government talking about criminals, about detention, about people that they are unwanted. The first that they went out vocally and they were in the, in the press and they were mobilizing people were the local authorities, the mayor, the prefect, the local governor actually. They were calling people to stop, I mean, their entrance to Moria. The privileged, these privileged people in March, they couldn't, because of the COVID, because of all of this happened, and Erdogan using them as a bomb, and the rhetoric in the media was, they are coming, we are facing a threat. The people were a threat, publicly, everywhere in the media. Greeks were protecting their country by stopping refugees from coming. That was insane. And of course, there was fascists that they were prof they make profit of this rhetoric. And they, there was a, a, a generalized xenophobic and racist rhetoric that was spread all over. NGOs were uh, criminals. NGOs were bringing the people they were smuggling. Everywhere you hear this. They, 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 and of course, when the authorities, the local authorities are calling them to mobilize and stop people by entering, like the boat that they were throwing stones to in uh, the 1st of March, at this point, they, they make blocks. This is a fascist practice and not police was interfering. They were stopping cars of volunteers, of refugees, of tourists even, because they, had, uh, they were not uh, 
locals and they were sto throwing stones, they were beating people. They were, the extreme violence in the 1st of March, 1st to 3 of March this year, we had 300 cars broken by locals. They were stopping locals, the locals, to see if they carry refugees or if they carry food. It was crazy. And nobody is talking about this. All our cars were broken. People were threatened. There were um, Facebook threats, physical threats, beating of people, beating of refugees. Crazy. The level of violence was crazy. And how do you explain this this level of violence? Like, is this rhetoric spreading out? Is this? Um... It, it's a combination. It was the bad uh, moment that uh, we had. Uh, riots against the government because they were trying to, to build a camp here. And this, uh, because we all participated uh, in the resistance to the new camp. After this, it was Erdogan sending the refugees as a bomb. It was the local media talking about the threat and the patriotism and whatever. It was the local authorities calling the, the locals to, as a, you know, this, uh, calling them to mobilize against refugees, that we were protecting our country. And all this rhetoric, of course, about the, the corrupted NGOs, all of the NGOs were corrupted, all of us were NGOs, no activists, the activists were very bad and they were bringing, all this was there and it was allowed, it was vocal, it was everywhere. And I'm, I'm really, I believe that people were tired in Moria. They, they are tired living next to a camp that is, people are suffering, there's a lot of violence. I understand this, but people going against people, people stopping children of landing, it's unacceptable and should have been, I mean, it, it should have been a court and an investigation on this and still nothing happened. Yeah. It's really this uh, position of, of the lawless. Um, Kashev, I, I think I have two questions. Uh, one is what is Effie is also mentioning is this idea of uh, criminalization not only of refugees but also of NGOs and and the um, alarm uh, phone um, is also I mean I was just looking at the website um, is also putting uh, today an article about um, threats that NGOs are getting captains of rescue boats um, putting to 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 trial etc so one of my questions is, is this getting worse and what is it uh, fueled by and the other question is um, I believe you are a lot operating a lot in in the German context also if I'm right uh, and so in the Netherlands um, Germany was very much praised by uh, Merkel's wir schaffen das uh, on the same time, she of course came back also to a lot of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, initial openness or opening the borders. So um, could you share a bit with us your impressions on if it comes to the repercussions it had uh, for German society? Uh, so first, uh, I want to just uh, mention something. Uh, the rates of right wing not connected to refugee issue, but politician loves to put the blame on refugees and migration flow just to, to satisfy the right wing population. And they have this kind of uh, populistic speech to please them. So uh, it's, it's not all because that uh, People, non-European coming uh, to Europe, uh, affecting or uh, driving us to this race of uh, right wing. No, and actually, as Eva was saying, like right wing, like the local people were doing awful, illegal actions against humans, and there is no reaction from the authorities. There is no investigation. There is not a single. Uh, court case and the other side you find that they are not just it's it's not about the criminalization of the migrants it's not about the criminalization of refugees or even of the civil society NGOs now it's criminalizing asylum itself as it's uh, something bad that we have to get rid of 
Like instead of canceling the asylum system, no, we just decriminalizing the asylum itself. We criminalizing the refugees, we criminalizing the people who move, we criminalizing the operations itself, we criminalizing the NGOs helping, we are criminalizing even the normal people who got uh, empathy about the situation and trying to help with their personal resources, like driving a car or uh, delivering a food or medical equipment. This is crazy. So, and now when, when it comes to the German context, actually, the open investigations on the NGOs working in the refugee uh, assistance supporting sector, instead of opening investigation on the right wing groups killing people, like in Hanau, Six months ago, they killed, they go to the shisha bar, to a coffee shop, and they opened fire to the people. And in the end, for sure, the conclusion is a psychopath did it. They don't want to say it. It's a systematic behavior because of the media, because of the politician uh, language, actually. They want to control people through fear. So what's the risk? Ah, Erdogan is opening the borders. People are coming. This is a risk. Out of ignorance, ignorant, like ignorant people don't say this is a kind, I'm sorry, but we are living in a capitalism. Huh? And this is, could be a chance. This is a human resources. On the other side, Germany is saying that our labor market need New skills need migrants and hand workers and experienced and expats. But they don't think about that. We have already people arrived here and we just given training and orientation. And also the misuse of the integration. Actually, integration, it's a linguistic, it's a nice word because it's it's the interaction between two cultures, between two human being civilizations. It's, it's not about including someone inside the new society and you have to follow. Otherwise, what the meaning of this integration word they mean? Like me, myself, living here for, in Germany for more than three years or something, and I didn't meet a single German who really integrated in the German society. So what integrate, it's different. Like it's different from the capital, from Berlin, different from Frankfurt, from Hamburg, like even inside the different cities. When I was in Greece, it's totally different in the islands, in Thessaloniki, in, in, in Athens. But we, we don't say it openly. We don't say it clearly. We just talk about general manners, about general uh, social uh, behavior that one everyone in the society follow. And, and, and this is really, this is the problem here. Yes, yeah, so it has, it's a lot of, um, it has a lot to do with language also, this idea of a myth, the myth of one nation state, the myth of one nationality, the myth of integration, it's all kind of uh, mystified language that actually um, re uh, hides a lot of um, systematic inequality, systematic oppression, systematic exclusion. Um, and, and, and so I would like to go back to that question again, of course, what to do. But before I, I want to put it a bit uh, aside still, although we also slowly, it's already nine o'clock, but I will take a bit more time and then check. I see already that there is, uh, yes, okay. So there is one question coming in and I would like to read it because it's so uh, close to what we're discussing. So one of the questions is, what can I as a European citizen do to change the situation? I feel very powerless. So I think this very much uh, resonates with uh, what we're feeling as well, or as, uh, at least what I'm feeling uh, also. But before we try to uh, give this person an answer, uh, I would like to even make it a bit more uh, complicated. Um, because of course we tend now to focus a lot on uh, the borders of Europe and, and refugee camps like Moria that became very uh, known 
uh, Effie's image uh, disappeared. I hope she's still with us. Ah, there she is. Um, but, uh, and I think, uh, Kashev, you also, uh, part of your research is also focusing on what's happening in Turkey, what's happening in, uh, in Egypt, in, in, in Libya. So there are, of course, a lot of refugee camps also at the other side of the Mediterranean, where we maybe speak much less about, and even worse, uh, European Union started a lot of deals, making deals with uh, regimes in, in Libya uh, and Turkey. So could you uh, maybe both of you share a bit uh, what's happening there? Like on what level should we imagine uh, people and what circumstances are people there? Uh, what, where should change happen if it comes to um, make, create better con conditions for the people at the other side that we're not even able to cross yet? And uh, how come, how is it possible? Uh, and how, how, what are the consequences of these deals that we are creating with these uh, regimes? Um, so, for example, if, I'm, uh, if I wanted to talk about the EU relations with uh, certain countries, uh, it, it was famous in 2016, the, sc the scandal of the deal. It's a deal. It's not an agreement. It was a deal with Turkey, give them money to close the borders and keep the people there. The situation in, uh, in, in Turkey, actually, uh, for refugees outside the camps or inside the camps, um, it's it's not okay. It's not okay at all. They they have no right for a lot of things. The UNHCR there cannot operate and cannot work without a permission from the state. And this is the same case in Egypt. In Egypt, for example, there is no national asylum law. It's all on the UNHCR, and UNHCR all the time complaining that they have low capacity and they have uh, to get permissions from the state. And the situation in Libya, I think it's its, it's own. Like last year, the CNN did a report and it was kind of, if you want to go there, if you don't afraid of your life and you don't have uh, fears and uh, your agency uh, leave you to go there to do uh, a piece about the things happening there, it's obvious, it's public. It's there for years. That's why, what makes people actually want to cross. Because in the first stage, no one will leave his, her home. One, no one will leave <clears throat> her comfort zone, okay, her house, family, uh, the life that you used to live if there is not really danger in your life. And that's what makes people in the first stage flee from their homelands, from the places that they raised in and they have the memories in. And then they move to another country. For example, it's, it's, it's a really big topic if we want to speak in details. But for example, in Egypt, I witnessed when Syrians just flee Syria because the situation and the war there and just flee to Egypt just to reside in Egypt, to live in Egypt. And the situation was not handleable at all. It, 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 it was really crazy. You don't have the right uh, to work. You don't have access to public uh, uh, hospitals. You don't have uh, the access to the education system. You have nothing. And, uh, and there, even if you have this asylum, card, it's, it's a yellow UNHCR, yellow card there. If you have this asylum card, you have to go to the Egyptian Migration Authority to renew your residence every six months. That pushed people and forced people to leave, to cross the sea, to go to Turkey, to cross from Egean because it's easier and shorter than Central Mediterranean. But all the times they were crossing from Egypt and from Libya. And, and that makes people arrive here in Europe. And actually, all the time I, I say that it's not a European responsibility to solve the global migration issue. Handle your internal crisis, handle your issues inside first. But what EU doing is paying money, millions, billions of money 
every year just to manage the migration, what they call migration crisis. They have a big a strategy called migration crisis management. And there's a lot of money, really. Egypt alone takes 60 million euros from the African Trust Fund for development projects and projects related to refugees. This is just one country, huh? So imagine if we spend this amount of money inside Europe for, call it integration projects, call it development projects, call it whatever you want a project, just to include the newcomers, the migrants inside the society, to teach them the local languages, to teach them different technical skills that help them to go into market because they want to be productive. But when you put a human being in hold for two years at least waiting for a paper so they can move, they can live a normal life, what we call normal life, for sure they, they lose the orientation. So th th this is a big problem. And actually, uh, just about the question that you said what to do, every single European citizen have the power. We are living in a democratic countries. At least we still have this democratic system. You have the power of voting. You have the power of putting pressure in, the poli in, the, in your politicians, in your national politicians. You have the power to speak with your neighbors. You have the power to go print a small info sheet from the internet and print it and distribute it in your neighborhood, in your city. This, this is a power. You are not powerless. Wherever you are, you are not a powerless person. You have a lot of tools to do. If you cannot be a, an activist or you see seen this activism is a big word and I cannot get involved, do the small things. Use the tools in your hand. Thank you, Kashef. I think that's indeed very important because we also tend to kind of lament about our own powerlessness and that's also very privileged, of course. Um, so I think indeed pointing at um, the very basic and important things uh, that we can do is uh, super important. On the same time, I think part of the, this powerlessness comes from the fact that uh, and I'm looking at, at Effie and, uh, and, and imagining um, how tired uh, you might be. And uh, you told me about um, possible eviction of PICPA. So you're also having a lot of, uh, let's say, struggles and worries that are there at this uh, very moment. And here we are with the three of us very probably aware, uh, repeating things to each other that we know that we are so uh, angry and frustrated about, but that we feel we still have to keep on uh, repeating. And on the same time, we know the information is there. So if it's about information sheets, if it's about talking to our neighbors, they, the neighbors could also be informed. It's, so it's a matter of, do you want to be informed? So what do we do um, against this probably populist rhetoric um, that is very difficult sometimes to fight with information also. Maybe it's not about information, maybe it's about finding metaphors, maybe it's about finding emotions um, that can help for people to make this click, that we created this myth of fear, whereas actually there is plenty of space to share, there's plenty of possibility to be together and become a better nation instead of this terrible, deep, intense black chapter that we're creating and that seems to be never ending with so much guilt and so much death and so much uh, oppression. Um, Effie, um, maybe you could share uh, your struggles at the moment for PICPA and, and also uh, take a moment for a call out that we can at least, all listeners that feel powerless, even though we've all listened to Kashev, what we can do uh, we can even do more, uh, signing a very important call of, uh, of Effie that you will uh, talk about a bit now. And maybe you could also respond to what we're talking about now, this feeling of, okay, how do you continue? How do you continue to keep on hope, um, to fight? Look, I, I, totally, I agree with Kasif. I also believe that uh, we cannot give up because it's about our future, it's about what, uh, what we want uh, for this future, for this world, for this Europe. 
So I think we cannot go back to this. We can do small things. I think the best, the, the most important thing is not to give up first and then to work all of us because we, we need to work together to, to find new ways to connect, uh, new ways to react. Uh, and it's, it's a process. It's something that is for all, all our life, but it's important to find it. It's important to work on it. Small things, bigger things, stay connected. Be aware as much as we can and not to live, I mean, to understand that this is a struggle for our life, for our future. It's very, very important. And in, it's in one way for me, really. I'm not saying that we need to suffer or to do the big activists. Small things stay connected and somehow being there. Um, it's the eighth uh, eviction uh, threat for PICPA, but this time it's hard because the moment they decided this new, I mean, terrible camp because they, they stole, the Moria was burned. And I think the only good thing that can happen with Moria was to be burned, finished. It was not, it was, a, I mean, there was, so we didn't celebrate because people stayed in the streets, uh, uh, racism, xenophobia grow. We, we were worried about these people being hungry in the streets of Lesbos. The authorities couldn't even feed them. And uh, they created, a, they found a military place, they put them in, the idea of the camp prevails. EU is, is supporting them. That's the most, uh, I mean, the really, frustrating aspect and the really dangerous aspect of these policies. Okay, we put them in the in a in a camp with tents, with nothing, with no water, no electricity. This is details. They don't need water and electricity. Some food, some organization feeding them like animals. Sorry, it's disgraceful. And with a lot of funds. Okay. And we put them also in another fence, fence uh, the COVID, uh, the, the ones that they were in COVID, uh, COVID cases, we put them also in a fence, great. Anyway, in this context, the government decided that they will call, call, uh, close all the alternative camps like PICPA with dignified conditions and Karate Pet, that is a camp for 1,200 people, that is quite for vulnerable, and they will uh, gather all the people in this new camp, which has no standard. And uh, Europe is watching them, and we have to fight again for PICPA and for the what? For, for basic things. That dignity, human places are more needed more than ever. And if we stop more, yeah, and if we want to, 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 to save this society of lessons that is a, a is really threatened by fascism and xenophobia and racism. We need to decongest the island today. We need to pay, take people in human conditions to share burden and this, make a plan after so many years about what will happen with these people. They are not animals, they are not. They are people. We cannot move them from one place to the other and be, being unwanted in different places and suffering and keep only the dignified shelters that exist and the, it is also a, a much cheaper solution because this, what they are creating there, will cost a lot of money. For people to suffer, they, Europe will pay a lot of money. So we call people because we have 15 days. PIPA will be closed according to the Ministry of Migration and Ministry of Labor in uh, the 15th of uh, August and the end of uh, December. So we, in our Facebook, it's Lesbo Solidarity, uh, PICPA, we call people, uh, we have a separate action which is called Save PICPA, Save Dignity. Please follow this and then we have all the actions there. All these days, the people, there is also a call for uh, groups and uh, collectives, already 170 they signed. A, a call for, uh, for action and against the closure of PICPA in our uh, campaign. And uh, we are uh, putting color all over PICPA now. So we try also the active friends of choirs, musicians, painters. We are painting the place and we believe that is a symbol of solidarity and we have to go on. I mean, it's, it may, for me, it's reasonable 
to, to, to try to protect PICPA when a monster is creating next to us. So Save PICPA, Save Dignity uh, campaign, it's on our Facebook. Um, join it, uh, share with us. We try to, to, to have different actions and stay connected. We need to this. We need to keep on going. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Effie. Um, so Lesbos Solidarity <laughs> Facebook, Save PICPA. I don't know terms. if I wrote it here, but I don't know if I can. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, I yes. Don't yes. Know. Go a little, yes, yes, perfect. Keep it in, in the, so save PICPA, save dignity, put it on, uh, your on Facebook or Facebook and right I will now. Also the Lesbos Solidarity. And uh, follow all the actions around Lesbos Solidarity uh, and save uh, PICPA. Um, very and important. We, and we need to understand that now in Lesbos, we, try, we have a case about alarm phone. We don't know when will be our case. But we are all staying uh, connected with them because what we uh, what they are fighting is that people who are not drowned in the sea, that people uh, no more lives will uh, will lose more lives in this very friendly sea, uh, Aegean, and that we will stop the violation of rights of people, which is a European policy, which is pushback. Pushbacks are happening every day now. And they put the life of people, I'm not talking about the rights, in danger. And instead of stopping pushback, we criminalize NGOs that are working against it. It's disgraceful. It's insane. It's insane. 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 Kashef, what do what, uh, what you think of this extreme absurdity um, that Effie um, is um, articulating so well about the fact that actually this creation of pushbacks, prisons, border is costing so much money and it's creating bombs out of humans that then create even more violence. Um, how to uh, change this, this crazy absurd, absurdistic logic um, that is uh, in the end killing us all because I think that's very important what Effie is saying is that um, the only the only way forward is to fight this because it's actually also about our lives and I think that's really important that we should understand if we want a world that we can stand for if we can live a world in which we don't have the feeling that we have to violate morally ourselves constantly we should we should fight now so please, Kashef, any thoughts that you still want to share? Because uh, we are rounding up, but um, a a any thoughts that you still want to share about this? Uh, I would say it's all about knowledge, about education. It's all about optimism and not to lose hope for all the people that they are involved in this situation to keep going on, to keep resisting this absurd and this ridiculous behavior of different states to put pressure in the politicians to change the policies, to keep speaking out with people, with different people, because there is actually people that they are not politicized. They, they, they don't care. They don't see the point that you are discussing now about uh, making pumps out of humans because of the violations they face. So simply each one, each one, th th this, this, this actually was a simple strategy, I would say that we learned from the Black African uh, civil movement in, in the States. They kept their struggle and they, they, they still fighting and they still struggling about their rights. And we, we learn from this movement a lot since ages, like since decades, at least 60 years, and they still doing that. They still educating the new generation. They don't lose the hope. They are look, looking for a change. And when they, for the first time in the history, the U.S. had a black president. For sure, it, it didn't last. For sure, he was also going with the same political identity of the state. But the thing that we cannot stop until we see the society that we are 
like to live in, or at least when we are dying and it's our end of the time on the earth, we feel that we didn't stop. We don't regret a simple move that we make for seeing a better life, not just for, for, for others, but also for us. Thank you so much, uh, Kashef, uh, Effie, for this very moving words. I'm uh, deeply touched. Each one, teach one. I think that's really uh, beautiful to end with. Also because with that sentence, you combine different struggles that are so much inspiring each other and reinforcing each other. I have one uh, last thing to share um, because also in Belgium, there's an action coming from cultural institutions demanding uh, for uh, Belgium society to uh, take on uh, refugees. Um, and they are actually, uh, and again, School of Resistance is launching a call uh, as we want to ask European policymakers that every art and cultural institution that signs this open letter to the European Commission um, be given the right to receive and support a refugee. We therefore ask for a visa for Belgium for one refugee per signatory. Let's rehumanize Europe together. So this is one uh, small action that we uh, started and everyone that's interested and wants to sign the petition can go to entegent.be. Uh, and hopefully it's uh, made possible for every cultural institution to uh, support a refugee by applying for visa. Um, thank you so, so much, Effie Latsudi, Mohamed al Kashef, for your super important input, your courage, your strength, your energy, your time to spend with us. Um, please let us know, let's stay in touch whenever we can help each other to find each other and use the resources we have to amplify our voices. Thank you so much. Keep on the good work. Thank you so big, much. Big Thank pleasure you. to meet you. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Ciao.